Hi, welcome to the solar neutrino problem, part one. Okay, let's start by talking about how the solar neutrino problem arose. The Homestake Solar Neutrino Observatory was an experiment located in the Homestake Gold Mine in South Dakota. It looked for neutrinos from the sun starting in 1967 and running until 1994. And its results were not what people expected. Homestake's measurements of the solar neutrino flux persistently showed a deficit compared to what was predicted. They saw a flux of neutrinos that was only about one-third of what was expected from the Sun. And the discrepancy didn't end there. Another experiment, GALAX, and its successor, the Gallium Neutrino Observatory, GNO, also measured the flux of solar neutrinos. This experiment was located inside Grand Sasso Mountain in Italy. GALAX ran from 1991 to 1997, and GNO ran from 1998 to 2003. At the same time, SAGE, a similar experiment at the Boxon Neutrino Observatory in Russia, started running in 1989. And these experiments also showed a deficit of solar neutrinos compared to what was predicted they saw about half as many solar neutrinos as were expected. So basically, measurements of the flux of neutrinos coming from the sun persistently showed a smaller number than what was predicted. This puzzled physicists for many years and became known as the solar neutrino problem. Of course, possible explanations were considered. Perhaps the experiments have some unrecognized problem. Maybe we really don't understand how the sun works. Or maybe something exotic is going on. Now we know that this was the first experimental evidence for neutrino masses. Ray Davis Jr. of the Homestake Experiment got the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physics for the observation of cosmic neutrinos. Okay, so this is a two-part series. Here in part one, we will talk about how the solar neutrino problem arose. We'll talk about solar neutrinos in the standard model, and then we'll talk about the experiments. Homestake, Galax, slash GNO, and Sage. References can be found in the description below. In part two, we'll talk about how the solar neutrino problem was solved and the experimental results that went into that. We should note that dividing the experiments into those that found the problem and those that solved the problem is somewhat artificial. The distinction is rough at best. We should note that in this two-part series, we're going to concentrate on the experimental results and how they fit together to raise and then solve a problem. We will be extremely light on the actual experimental details. Okay, so first, let's talk a bit about neutrinos in the standard model. Okay. Here's the particle content of the standard model. It contains six quarks and six leptons. The quarks are the up, down, charm, strange, top, and bottom. The leptons consist of three neutrinos and three charged leptons, the electron, muon, and tau. Next, we have the gauge bosons, which transmit forces. They are the photon, Z, W plus, and W minus, and the gluons. Finally, we have the Higgs boson. Here, we're interested in the neutrinos, which are three of the six leptons. Okay, as we saw in the previous slide, there are three neutrinos in the standard model. Each neutrino is paired with one of the charged leptons. This defines the flavor of the neutrino. 
So the neutrino paired with the electron is the electron neutrino. Similarly, we have the muon neutrino and the tau neutrino. The type of neutrino indicates how it interacts with the W boson and a charged lepton. For example, here we have a positively charged W plus boson. It can decay into a positron, which is the antiparticle of the electron and labeled here as an E plus, and an electron neutrino. I should note here that we've used the convention that arrows are reversed on antiparticle lines. As the positron is the electron's antiparticle, it is drawn with its line reversed. Alternatively, the W plus can decay into a mu plus and a muon neutrino, or a tau plus and a tau neutrino. Additionally, each flavor of neutrino also interacts with the electrically neutral Z boson. Here we show a diagram that represents a Z decaying to an electron neutrino and electron antineutrino. It can also decay into a muon neutrino and muon antineutrino, or a tau neutrino and tau antineutrino. The W can also interact with the quarks. Here we've taken the diagram we had before and attached a pair of quarks to the upper left corner. In this diagram, we can have an up quark, which has an electric charge two thirds, decay into a down quark, which has a charge minus one third, and a W plus boson. The W can then disintegrate into an E plus and an electron neutrino, as shown before. So an up quark can turn into a down quark, a positron, and an electron neutrino. Now let's look at the nucleons, protons and neutrons. Roughly speaking, a proton consists of two up quarks and a down quark. Their charges are two thirds, two thirds, and minus one third, which add up to plus one, the charge of the proton. A neutron consists of one up quark and two down quarks. Their charges add up to zero. Now, let's see how that relates to what we saw before. In a nuclear process, an up quark in a proton can turn into a down quark, turning the proton into a neutron. In doing so, it emits a positron and an electron neutrino. In the sun, there are many interactions that produce neutrinos. Here we list a few examples. If you look closely, you'll see that in each case, a proton is being converted into a neutron. So in the sun, we have reactions that are related to the diagram we saw before, or a closely related diagram where instead of producing a positron, we destroy an electron. Now, we could ask, what about the same diagram, but with a mu plus and a muon neutrino? Or a tau plus and a tau neutrino? Nuclear reactions in the sun involve energies of the order of MeV, that's mega electron volts. The rest energy of the electron which is its mass times C squared, is 0.511 MeV. So you need just over half an MeV of energy to make an electron. This is very possible in nuclear interactions. But a muon's rest energy is 106 MeV, and a tau's rest energy is almost 1800 MeV. There simply isn't enough energy in nuclear reactions in the sun to make a muon or a tau particle. So since there isn't enough energy to make a muon or a tau, 
they aren't made in the sun. And that means there aren't muon or tau neutrinos made either. So to a very good approximation, all the neutrinos made in the sun are of the electron type. Okay, now we need to say a few words about neutrino masses and flavor. Technically, as it's written, neutrinos are massless in the standard model. But neutrino masses are easy to add in. And, as we now know, neutrinos aren't actually massless. Okay, I'm going to give a couple slides on neutrino flavor change for people who have had a class in quantum mechanics. If you haven't, just sit tight and I'll summarize what you need to know for the rest of the video. Okay, for those people who have been exposed to quantum mechanics, I'm just going to give a rough idea of how flavor change comes about. The basic points are that mass and flavor eigenstates do not have to be the same. So the mass eigenstates are linear superpositions of the flavor eigenstates and vice versa. Mass is closely related to energy, so it's not surprising that flavor eigenstates are also typically not energy eigenstates. So a neutrino produced in a flavor eigenstate can evolve in time to a linear superposition of flavor eigenstates. Okay. Now, for the people who haven't had a class in quantum mechanics, here's the takeaway message that you need. If neutrinos have masses, and those masses aren't all the same, then neutrinos can change flavor. If we see neutrinos change from one flavor into another, that is evidence for neutrino masses. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about the Homestake experiment. The Homestick experiment looked for interactions between incoming solar neutrinos and a chlorine nucleus. They used a tank of 615 metric tons of tetrachloroethylene. They looked for this reaction. An electron neutrino interacts with a chlorine 37 nucleus, turning it into an argon 37 nucleus and releasing an electron. Now, chlorine 37 contains 17 protons and 20 neutrons. Argon 37 contains 18 protons and 19 neutrons. So, we're looking at a reaction where an electron neutrino interacts with a neutron, turning it into a proton and releasing an electron. Before, we saw a diagram where a proton turns into a neutron via a W plus boson. The neutrino interaction at home stake went through a very similar diagram where a neutron turned into a proton via a W minus boson. Here, we can read this diagram from left to right. So the neutron and electron neutrino are in the initial state, and the proton and electron are what comes out of the reaction. So an incoming solar neutrino can convert a neutron into a proton, which can turn chlorine 37 into argon 37. The Homestake experimenters then looked for these produced argon-37 atoms. Note that we only included electron neutrinos in this diagram. As we mentioned earlier, solar neutrinos have energies of order MeV. They don't have enough energy to make a muon or a tau. So, a muon or tau neutrino would not be able to participate in this interaction. 
This means that if there were muon or tau neutrinos coming from the sun, this experiment would not be able to see them. Okay, let's look at their results. They reported a neutrino capture rate of 2.56 plus or minus 0.23 times 10 to the minus 36 per target atom per second. They compared this to predictions from solar models, which ranged from 6.4 to 9.3 times 10 to the minus 36 in the same units. So the observed rate was much lower than the expected. So basically, there were a lot of missing neutrinos. Okay, now let's talk about GALAX, GNO, and SAGE. These experiments all looked for the reaction where an electron neutrino impinges on a gallium-71 nucleus, transforming it into a germanium-71 nucleus and emitting an electron. A gallium-71 nucleus has 31 protons and 40 neutrons, while a germanium nucleus has 32 protons and 39 neutrons. So again, just like before, we're seeing the reaction where an electron neutrino interacts with a neutron, turning it into a proton and releasing an electron. So not surprisingly, this process proceeds through the same diagram that we saw before. And just like Homestake, these experiments are only sensitive to electron neutrinos and not muon or tau neutrinos, as there is not enough energy in a solar neutrino to make a muon or a tau. GALAX and GNO looked for this reaction using 100 tons of gallium chloride. Meanwhile, SAGE used 50 tons of liquid metallic gallium. The combined result for GALAX and GNO was a capture rate of 69.3 plus or minus 5.5 times 10 to the minus 36, while SAGE's was 70.8 with a slightly larger error bar. They compared those with the values predicted from solar models, which were almost twice as large with error bars of about 10%. So again, there were a lot of missing neutrinos. Okay, so that was the solar neutrino problem. Experiments measuring the flux of solar neutrinos persistently got results that were lower than expected. Now let's briefly give a preview of what we're going to see in part two. Okay, so what we've seen so far is that Neutrinos from the sun are essentially all produced as electron neutrinos. And the initial experiments to measure the solar neutrino flux were only sensitive to electron neutrinos. While this seems reasonable, we'll see in the next part that this actually was the problem. Okay. So in part two, we'll see how the solar neutrino problem was resolved.